I keep saying I'm not planning on making a recap episode for every episode of X-Men 97. Like, it's good and there's a lot going on. But like, you know, what am I going to say? Oh, that character at the end of this episode did something kind of interesting in the comic. So, you know, look out for him. He'll probably come up in like a couple episodes. That's what I was expecting to say about last week's episode, Motendo slash Life Death. And that's not to say I didn't like those episodes, but like I didn't have anything really to say. Besides, like, hey, it's interesting that that guy shows up at the very end. But this episode, remember it, was not that. This was everything. And, like, I just watched it maybe, like, an hour ago. And I I can't get over how much stuff it was. I think I said this in a video a little while ago. The X-Men, when working well, are three things. Backflips, civil rights, and soap opera. And this episode got all of it. Like, some really really cool looking backflips although to be honest and spoilers from here on out for the first 20 minutes of the episode i was like are they gonna even do a fight or something like are we gonna see some cool stuff happen here because like i kind of want to see some backflips and then went in a very different direction i wasn't expecting this but i was like as an x-men fan who knows the deal with genosha and knows the ease for extinction story where sentinels destroy genosha You can't see Genosha start and not get a little antsy, but like you figure it gets more than a day to exist uh, in this like state, you know, Uh, and we don't know, I guess at this point, who laid this trap besides just that the wild sentinels potentially or like some sort of new sentinel thing did it like we don't have a villain behind all of this. Trask seems to be locked up. Guy Rich seems to know more than he says, but like. This also seems to be related in some way to Sinister or at least Madeline Pryor's dreams. And if Cable was involved, maybe this is an apocalypse thing. Although I don't see why apocalypse would want to make a big evil sentinel monster bug thing. So, all right, stuff from the beginning. The Rogue and Magneto stuff, I was way wrong about that last time I talked about this on the on the videos. Like, I expected that because they were so on the nose with that in the past, that this would be something that Gambit was reading too far into. And like, it would almost like, not a misunderstanding necessarily, but like in a couple episodes, he'd confront her and be like, oh, Ro, why are you doing this to me? And she'd be like, Gambit, you're crazy. And then she'd show him like, I don't know, security camera footage of her Magneto reading quietly in a room and then giving each other a high five. And then he'd, you know, maybe storm out and be like, I was really mean to you, Rogue. Let's get married or something. That was kind of what I was expecting. The fact that we're doing more stuff with Gambit and Rogue and Magneto at all, it's like, well, that, that's interesting. And then the, the, the fact that we learn we, they had more history than they ever had, I think, in the comics. Like in the comics, it was a very, like I, I've said before, like they were working together in the Savage Land. It was a short thing and then it, it didn't happen again. It was hinted at a lot in the other comics but it never really like they're not a couple the same way that the show set them up as so the fact that they like did that i thought was interesting and like it's fun because it's magneto right like we know magneto he's this incredibly serious driven mutant with all the pathos in the world and also if he can uh make that turn that into something where he can also hook up with rogue that will also happen like it's I, I do like that like he's not perfect and obviously it's magneto he's not perfect but like this he's he's very petty and in a very i guess the, the fun part about it is it's very transparent like he's just like oh, i'd like to have rogue be my queen how does that make you feel remy and it's just like yeah good go for it i like that they're doing so much soap opera stuff but man i because you get to the end of this episode and you forget about all the madeline Pryor, jean ray stuff so we're doing like and i i don't remember the fallout of madeline Pryor, jean gray in the comics but this feels a lot like the fallout of emma scott and jean in the comics where emma was like just having a psychic hookup with scott and then Jean was like, you're sharing our brain, your brain with her. That was supposed to be our thing. And then they uh, they break up again. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about the first couple episodes is how many people were like, oh, Cyclops, so cool. Cyclops is great. And now we're seeing Cyclops just like absolutely lose it. And besides all the actual stuff that happens at the end of this episode, that interview, I, w- I want to go back and watch that and like really, really look at that. But like that is some unhinged stuff. And like that's enough, I think. To just buy back all of the goodwill you've ever bought X-Men. Like and then the, the Gene thing, it's just it's pretty funny. Cause like I, I I get it. You know, he's in a rough spot. He doesn't know who his wife was and when she wasn't hers. So now that one of them's back, he doesn't know which one it was. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh I like that Madeline Pryor is up to stuff. I guess again, I like how small some of these characters are and how much 
they're in this big mission of civil rights, but they're also like what I did enjoy when we were hooking up and they made me go to the other island, but I'm still going to like do stuff. Especially some of the stuff that Gene was saying to Scott felt very just like out of any relationship, right? How many how many days have you been texting her for? When when did you see her last? Like, I don't know. It was, it was just really funny. That was great. Gene and Logan kissed. I think that feels like it's kind of out of nowhere, but it's not. It's, it's never out of nowhere. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's it's never been my favorite part of these. But again, it's like the 15th in, most interesting thing that happened in this episode. And like that was maybe the first thing in this episode that made me go, whoa, OK. Like, I don't know if that came before or after Scott's whole speech, but it was it was something that she did that kiss. And like, I just I don't know. I'm, I did not expect this couple to be breaking up so quickly. I expected there to be some friction from the Madeline stuff but not like this much friction. And then, you know, I don't even know if Madeline's still alive anymore. It's probably not. But if she was, like, I don't know what that's going to mean for this character in the future. Like, I can't tell if she is scheming. I don't think she's like purposefully trying to break up the X-Men or anything like that. But like this, this idea that she's just like kind of having what she thinks is a harmless fling uh, with Cyclops and like doing it the way that he kind of feels like he is versus like, doing this because she wants to get back at Jean Grey or take her place or something like I don't don't think it's that second thing uh but and maybe we'll never know because maybe we'll never do any Madeline Pryor stuff again also Nightcrawler's in it it's fun that Nightcrawler's in it it's fun some of the mutant cameos they have here although some of them I'm like really them you know like kind of like Battle Beast and Invincible like we got this whole group together and that guy and the one for me, and this is Exodus, who's just in the middle of the dance routine. Like, I'm happy that Exodus is able to chill and have a nice time in Genosha. But, like, you know, Multiple Man, Dazzler, those are some happy-go-lucky mutants compared to some of the rest of these guys. Uh, Exodus is not, but uh, I guess maybe he is now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember if we ever saw him in the uh, original animated series. I don't even know if that character existed when that came out, so probably not. But, um... That was dead. It's just funny to see him. I also like seeing the little kids, you know. Leech is always weird. Don't like him. Uh, Glob Herman's cool. Like to see more Glob Herman. And some Pixie. We got Pixie. So that's interesting. She could teleport without saying the magic words, but sure, whatever. We're not, we're not going to nitpick here. We also got a bunch of new accents, uh, and some of them came with characters. You got Banshee's back, and Banshee obviously has been in the show before, uh, but like he's working with Moira McTaggart, who has an accent that must be authentic because it's so much that like there's no way they just came up with that on the day you got callisto the uh morlock she's around i don't think she speaks and then you had the hellfire club now i don't remember what besides phoenix stuff we've ever done with the hellfire club but we got sebastian shaw and emma frost together as a couple so this is early emma frost and obviously this is really Emma. well like obviously but like when she was doing the genosha thing she was on genosha this is like in the comics. This is when she gets her diamond powers. This is how she survives this. Uh, I don't know where that puts her here, but I would assume like it seems like we're skipping right from Hellfire Club to potentially Grant Morrison X Men for her. Maybe I don't know, but like the Genosha attack is what changed that character's whole thing. So if they want to do more of that in the comics, this be an interesting place to put it. Also, it'd be fun to throw her into this mix right now with like Scott and Jean and Logan all having their stuff. And then, you know, Emma comes in. I like the, I couldn't tell who was doing the voice for her. The voice sounded kind of familiar. Let's look this up. Oh, Todd Habercorn. So the guy did the Irish voice is uh, Sebastian Shaw. Cool. Cool. I don't play Helldivers too, but General Brosh apparently. Do I Martha Marion and Todd Habercorn? Good. I, I enjoyed those performances. I hope we get a little bit more Emma Frost. I'm always down for more Emma Frost. Sebastian Shaw, I can, you know, we can do without him. Uh, but Emma Frost is interesting because of how much she is a character who, like, honestly could fill the role that Magneto has, which is a, a leader, someone with authority who believes they deserve it and has a vision they can carry out, but might be very different from what these other characters are doing. Like, I don't think she's gonna graduate to being in charge of the x-men now but i'm like that is you know this is a place for her uh nightcrawler was cool i think he was more german than i was expecting also small which is nice i guess then we do the breakup between rogue and remy which is interesting also interesting apparently the watcher is watching it which is never a great sign although you know hypothetically he was watch all the good stuff you know he'd watch the the best parts and the worst parts but uh, it seems like he shows up for the the really bad stuff a different looking watcher from the one from what if which i think is fine uh but just worth mentioning then we get the actual event the gala of whatever we're calling this first of all that line when when uh val cooper says 
uh, we don't usually let terrorists be presidents. And he said, yes, but so often we let presidents be terrorists. Like, Magneto, you, you never change. Perfect. I don't know. There was something so... It, the animation of him dancing with Rogue and the hands moving around and the... Yeah, it was a lot. And they, they really went for it in a way that I think is like... It, it was... I, I was like proud of them kind of. And I guess considering all the stuff that happens, it's good that this happened for Rogue and like that she had that moment of closure with Magneto and then, you know, this moment of clarity with Remy. But yeah, I don't know. I was like, they, they really went for it with that. And then Cable shows up and everybody's like, Cable. And I'm like, right, you guys know Cable. I mean, you guys know Cable. You don't know that he's your son. So good now that they know that. There's a lot of stuff like that where Cable would pop up and me watching it would be like, wait, do they know he's their son? They're not talking about it. But like, so now it's like, good. Now they know that. Uh, and then they all explode. I assume. Uh, well, I, you know what? To be fair, Madeline Pryor, Jean Grey clone. Maybe she survived. Uh, Banshee looks pretty dead. Marrow, I guess, also looks pretty dead. Those Morlocks not doing super hot. I did think when Magneto saved Leech and he had Leech, I was like, oh, no, Magneto, you don't know what that kid's deal is, bro. He's going to make your powers go away. Like, and that's not what happens. Thank God. But like, it's just like, man, Leech just cannot get anything right. Nightcrawler saves them. Very cool. And then, yeah, the big evil Sentinel bug thing, which like, so the wild sentinels in the E for Extinction story when Cassandra Nova sends those guys to get Genosha and like they massacre Genosha do pretty similar. I mean, I guess we don't know the numbers, but like something kind of similar. I don't remember them looking like that. I'm not sure. Like the, the design seems kind of familiar, but in my head, I'm like, does that look like something from something else, like some other show or something like that? Uh, but that was pretty, uh, it was pretty pretty gnarly but yeah like all that stuff was wild i never thought we would kill main x-men in the show like i did not think there was a chance we would kill someone like gambit or magneto or both i also think we had been kind of light on gambit action considering how cool he is and how much fun you know the acrobatics and the flick of the cards are like within the first four episodes we never really got too much insane gambit stuff besides that one moment with wolverine that was all in the trailer so i'm glad the Gambit had some cool moments. You know, we saw a flashback to the Holocaust. We just saw that. We didn't see, like, the mutant, you know, camps with the big M's on the eyes. We saw, like, the star, and it was... They're, they're doing it. They really... Like, this is the episode where I think they've always done this, but, like, they went for it. And it makes me so curious about what the future of this show is going to be. Here's what I assume based on previous episodes. Based on the end of Life, Death, Part 1, I just assumed the end of this season would be the mutant massacre and we would end up in the outback era where the adversary would kill all the x-men or something or whatever seemed to happen obviously it's not following that story exactly but like the x-men would maybe be seen to be dead and then someone like emma maybe could restart the school with some other mutants maybe or something i don't know so then we're doing like a generation x academy x story and then on the other side of the world in australia we're doing the outback x-men and you know that would have been fun but like this is also an option like we're going straight right now we're in the morrison territory we have skipped the outback story and now we are in cassandra nova territory we're in the new x-men i think is what this one was called i have so much trouble with this because it's like new x-men all new x-men and it's the one the grant morrison one where Cassandra Nova, Professor X's evil twin, psychic monster twin from the womb, uh, comes back and uh, wrecks shop. And that character is apparently going to be in Deadpool and Wolverine, or whatever we're calling it. I doubt it's going to be like some sort of crossover thing. If anything, it was like just both people working on both stories. It was like nobody's done anything with Cassandra Nova yet. I could see obviously why she makes sense here. And I can see why she would make sense in a Deadpool story where we're talking about variants because she kind of is a variant of Professor X because she's the twin that survived instead of, you know, so like I, I, that makes sense. Uh, with this, it's like, I don't even think we'll see her. It Maybe the Master Mold is the villain, but I, I don't know. Like, I just don't know what to expect. I feel like we've seen so much from this show. There, There's one thing I'm like a little curious about. Are we going to start resurrecting characters? Are we going to do Krakoa? Are we going to do resurrection protocols, all that stuff? And then other question, is this all a dream or something? Is time travel going to unravel uh, this? Because obviously we had the cable appearance, but also like that's the way these stories go sometimes. You see this really horrible version play out and then a time traveling mutant or something, maybe Bishop will come back and fix everything. I didn't expect that's what it would be, but like, man, they are speed running through some of this stuff, but not in a bad way either. Like I think the pacing on this was great. And like, I think the 
Genosha thing, that plot line was seeded very well throughout the season. I think the arc with Magneto and Rogue and Gambit was seeded very well throughout the season. And then some of this Madeline Pryor, Jean Grey Scott stuff has just been, you know, that's always been at the core of those characters' relationships. So then all that coming to a head in this episode, I think, felt completely natural. Uh, but just the fact that we're here now, it's like we just got a Genosha and now it's gone. So now what are we going to do? Like, what is the future for the X-Men? Are we going to do Krakoa? They could maybe do it. Are we going to do like the House of M situation where there is not a decimation in the sense that all the mutants lose their powers, but just so many of them are killed that now they have to like close ranks and just are, everybody is that's alive goes to the X mansion and just figures it out. Like, I, I really don't know. But, you know, I'm, I'm loving this show so far. I'm interested to see what we get from the, the end of life death because uh, that's next week. Like, I would be surprised if there's not more stuff with the adversary. Uh, but yeah, man, like if you've if you've never read the Grant Morrison Ease for Extinction X-Men comics, you can give it a look and kind of see what this was taking from. But it's just this. I mean, that, and that's one of the problems with X-Men comics. One of the things people don't love about it. It is this story about this oppressed minority. And, you know, they're obviously a big uh, metaphor and, and stuff. But also it's just seeing these group of people you know, be genocided again and again and again. And it's like, oh, we finally got a new place. Oh, we're living on Mars now. Oops, there's a genocide. Oh, now we get this cool island. Oh, the genocide. So, like, this is the first one of those, I guess, that we've seen, at least in this season. Um, but, like, that is the one thing I'd be a teeny tiny bit worried about is that the X-Men, uh, if this is just happens so often, the X-Men become this, like, just, oh, look, here's a little bit more trauma for these guys. I guess they'll never be happy. Like, and that's not fun. You do want a balance. You want them to have some sort of, like, happiness. Yeah, I mean, as far as episodes go, this is definitely going to be the one people remember. And I loved it. And I can't believe we're not even halfway through the series. Uh, we have a three-part finale coming up at the end of the season. And like this was a one episode. I can't imagine what a three-part finale looks like. So I'm very excited. I love the show. Thank you, Marvel, for making it. Everybody that's working behind the scenes and stuff. Just more strong guy. That's the one my one ask. If you saw the picture, you know, two weeks ago, which is great. Got the figure here. Him and Monet are waiting for their moment. But for now, uh, it is a really crazy episode of television that, uh, that I loved. And I think um, is going to sit with people for a while. I hope people watch it before they get certain things spoiled for them. I don't think they were expecting to have to worry about that. But now it's like, no, that's, this is one of those shows now where you can't go on Twitter. Otherwise, you'll see all the stuff. So thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you know, like and subscribe and stuff on the channel, all that. And uh, yeah, I'll see you around.